Exodus 20, 16 says, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Well, what is it to bear false witness? What is it to be a false witness? A false witness is someone who lies about someone else. False witnesses hurt other people by being untruthful. A witness is supposed to attest to the truth. A false witness brings in an untrue testimony. The Bible gives us a really great example of false witnesses. If you want to follow me in your Bible, turn to 1 Kings chapter 21, or if you just want to listen, but 1 Kings 21, beginning at verse 1. Give you a second to get there. All right. 1 Kings 21, verse 1. It says, King Ahab had a palace in Jezreel, and near the palace was a vineyard owned by a man named Naboth. One day, Ahab said to Naboth, since your vineyard is so convenient to the palace, I'd like to buy it to use as a vegetable garden. I will give you a better vineyard in exchange, or if you prefer, I will pay you for it. But Naboth replied, the Lord forbid that I should give you the inheritance that was passed down by my ancestors. So Ahab went home angry and sullen because of Naboth's answer. The king went to bed with his face to the wall and refused to eat. So here, here we have uh, King Naboth. He, he's coveting his... Uh, the, the, king Ahab's coveting Naboth's vineyard. It's right by the palace. He wants to buy it. He got, he, he got turned down. So now he's, he's laying in bed. He's sulking. He's very upset. Verse 5 says, What in the world is the matter? Uh, His wife Jezebel asked him. What has made you so upset that you are not eating? I asked Naboth to sell me his vineyard or to trade it, and he refused, Ahab told her. Are you the king of Israel or not? Jezebel asked. Get up and eat and don't worry about it. I'll get you Naboth's vineyard. So she wrote letters in Ahab's name, sealed them with a seal, and sent them to the elders and other leaders of the city where Naboth lived. In her letters, she commanded, call the citizens together for fasting and prayer and give Naboth Naboth a place of honor. Find two scoundrels who will accuse him of cursing God and the king, then take him out and stone him to death. So the elders and other leaders followed the instructions Jezebel had written in the letters. They called for a fast and put Naboth at a prominent place before the people. Then two scoundrels accused him before all the people of cursing God and the king. So he was dragged outside the city and stoned to death. The city officials then sent word to Jezebel, Naboth has been stoned to death. When Jezebel heard the news, she said to Ahab, you know the vineyard Naboth wouldn't sell you? Well, you can have it now. He's dead. So Ahab immediately went down to the vineyard to claim it. Well, that's an incredible story. Just think of it. Naboth owns a vineyard. King Ahab wants it. Naboth doesn't want to sell it because it's an inheritance from his ancestors. It's been in his family line probably for quite some time. But King Ahab wants it, and so he sulks about it. He won't eat. The queen Jezebel, wicked queen Jezebel, makes a plot She invites the citizens to an assembly for praying and fasting. Naboth is seated at the place of prominence, but it's a trap. Two scoundrels suddenly start saying, Naboth, curse God. Naboth, curse the king. And they're testifying about Naboth, but what they're saying is an absolute lie. But the people believe it. And so they take him out of the city, and they stone him to death. And these two scoundrels... Teach us what a false witness is. A false witness is a liar. And the Bible teaches that we're not to bear false witness against our neighbor. What these two scoundrels did cost Naboth his life. The the Lord saw the treachery of Ahab and listen to what he did. 1 Kings 21, 17. But the Lord said to Elijah, who was from Tishbe, Go down to meet King Ahab, who rules in Samaria. He will be at Naboth's vineyard in Jezreel, taking possession of it. Give him this message. This is what the Lord says. Isn't killing Naboth bad enough? Must you rob him too? Because you've done this, dogs will lick your blood outside the city just as they licked the blood of Naboth. 
because Ahab did this thing, God pronounced that dogs would lick up his blood outside the city, and that's exactly what happened. Ahab was killed by the providence of God, and dogs licked up his blood outside of the city. God avenged Naboth. A false witness can really hurt someone. God decreed very severe punishments for false witnesses in the days of Israel. Deuteronomy 19.16, it says this, If a malicious witness witness rises up against a man to accuse him of wrongdoing, then both the men who have the dispute shall stand before the Lord, before the priests and the judges who will be in office in those days. And the judges shall investigate thoroughly. And if the witness is a false witness and he's accused his brother falsely, then you shall do to him just as he had intended to do to his brother. Thus you shall purge the evil from among you. False witnesses were not tolerated. If a person would accuse his neighbor of something that would put him in jail for five years and then he was found to be a false witness, he would go to jail for five years. If he sought to put his neighbor to death by lying, then when he was found out, they would put him to death. They did this to stop people from being false witnesses. And there's most certainly people today who are in jail because of false witnesses. There's also people on the street who should be in jail because of false witnesses. They are free. A false witness takes away the righteous judgments of the court. And because of the false witness, a jury can make a mistake. The judge can make the wrong call as to sentencing. The Scythians, an ancient ancient people, they had a law about false witnesses. They said that when a man took an oath, if he lied, he was to lose his head. And the reason? Because a false witness takes away all truth and faith from among men. That's a quote from them. A false witness takes away all truth and faith from among men. The truth is vital. The truth is essential. When a false witness speaks, the truth is what's at stake. The Bible emphasizes the truth over and over again. God is called the God of truth. In Psalm 31, 5, it says, Into your hands I commit my spirit. Redeem me, O Lord, the God of truth. Jesus calls himself the truth. In John 14, 6, it says, I am the way and the truth. And the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of Truth. John 14, 16 says, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the Spirit of Truth. And so God is the God of Truth. Jesus is called the Truth. The Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of Truth. Truth is emphasized in the Trinity. Interestingly, Satan is called the Father of Lies. In John 8, 44, it says, You are of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. The devil does not stand in the truth. Whenever he speaks, he speaks a lie. He's a liar and the father of lies. That's what the Bible says. So what does that say about the false witness? The false witness is an imitator of Satan. The false witness is acting like the devil. Listen to these interesting verses that shed some light on how God looks at lying. Proverbs 6.16, There are six things which the Lord hates, yes, seven, which are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that run rapidly to evil, a false witness who utters lies, and one who spreads strife among brothers. There's seven things mentioned here that God hates. Two of them have to do with not telling the truth. God hates a lying tongue and a false witness. Many people have been destroyed by the lies of others. We saw the example in 1 Kings where Naboth was stoned to death because someone lied about him. Let me give you another example of a false witness, false witnesses in the Bible. If you have your Bibles, turn to Acts chapter 5, verse 1. Acts chapter 5, verse 1. Acts 5, 1, it says, I'll give you a second. I I still see some people turning. See other people punching there. All right, Acts chapter 5, verse 1. There was also a man named Ananias who was with his wife, Sapphira. 
Sapphira, there was also a man named Ananias who, with his wife Sapphira, sold some property. He brought part of the money to the apostles, but he claimed it was the full amount. His wife had agreed to this deception. Then Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart? You lied to the Holy Spirit, and you kept some of the money for yourself. The property was yours to sell or not sell, as you wished. And after selling it, the money was yours to give away. How could you do a thing like this? <clears throat> you weren't lying to us, but to God. As soon as Ananias heard these words, he fell to the floor and died. Everyone who heard about it was terrified. Then some young men wrapped him in a sheet and took him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, was this the price you and your husband received for your land? Yes, she replied. That was the price. And Peter said, how could the two of you even think of doing a thing like this, conspiring together to test the spirit of the Lord? Just outside that door are the young men who buried your husband, and they will carry you out too. Instantly, she fell to the floor and died. When the young men came in and saw that she was dead, they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear gripped the entire church and all others who heard what had happened. Ananias and Sapphira lied. They were false witnesses. They sold their land. They kept back part of the money for themselves, which was just fine. But where they went wrong was in saying they were giving the church all of the money. That was a lie. They were false witnesses. And they were lying to the Holy Spirit. In the early church, the Lord must have wanted to make an example of false witnesses because they were both struck dead immediately. Now, why would they lie about something like this in the first place? Why didn't they just say, here's a portion of the money we got when we sold our land. Why didn't they just say they were keeping some for themselves? Nothing wrong with that. It wouldn't have been a lie. Perhaps they felt some peer pressure. Perhaps they wanted to look good. If they gave all of the money they got for the land, that would have looked good like they were really making a sacrificial donation. I mean, who knows? We, we don't know for sure. But we do know this. The Lord saw their lie and took it very seriously. It's a sin to lie about other people like the two scoundrels did to Naboth. And it's a sin to lie about yourself like Ananias and Sapphira did. In either case, it's being a false witness. Now, this commandment has some broader applications what is the weapon of the false witness? The weapon of a false witness is his lying tongue. This commandment is meant to put a bridle on the lying tongue. Now, if we're to guard against a lying tongue, then it's implied that we are to guard the tongue from doing any harm to our neighbor at all. For instance, a person might not have an out-and-out -out lying tongue. They might even mean to have a truthful tongue, but they can still use it to hurt their neighbor a person can say something about another person they think is true, but they don't know for sure. And whatever it is, it can be hurtful. And what I'm talking about here is gossip. One time someone came up to me and asked if I was getting a divorce. This was quite a few years ago. And I said, no. Where did you hear that? And they told me who they had heard it from. Someone told them. And so now this person, what? So they come up to me. Well, this was several years ago now, and I don't know if I remember exactly how it started, but two things were going on. One, someone saw they thought they saw me with a blonde-haired woman at a PTA meeting. That was just, it was my brother, Kevin, and his wife. But they thought it was me because over the years, for some reason, a lot of people over the years have gotten my brother and I mixed up. They'll ask him, you know, they'll go to my brother and say, hi, Randy, you know, how's the chiropractic going? And he just says, fine, it keeps going, because it happens to him too many times. He doesn't want to correct him. And, and, and people have gone up to me and said, hey, Kevin, how's it going? I'll just, fine, keep going. You know, maybe I'm being a false witness when I say that. I don't mean it in that sort of a sense, but it's just that people get us mixed up. And... Uh, so, Kevin was at, he was at a PTA meeting with his wife, blonde-haired wife. At the same time, Ginny and I had put our house on the market. We wanted to sell our house back then. Didn't sell, but we wanted to. So this person put two and two together and figured, our house is for sale, 
and Randy's with another woman, they must be getting divorced. Pure gossip. None of it was true. And the person spreading this information was being a false witness. And they probably thought they were telling the truth. Now, the truth is they should have found out their facts a little better before they opened their mouth. Amen? What they said could have been really harmful. I mean, it really could have been. Fortunately, it didn't get very far, but that's how gossip works. That's what gossip is, is hearing something about another person, some, some juicy bit of information, and then sharing it with someone else, and it, it can really spread. Most of the time it does, but most of the time when a person gossips, they are at least in part being a false witness. They often don't know the full story. So gossip is often breaking the ninth commandment. We can really hurt others with our tongues, and we really need to watch what we say. James 3.2 says, We all stumble in many ways. If anyone is never at fault in what he says, he's a perfect man, able to keep his whole body in check. If a person is never at fault with their tongue, the Bible says they are a perfect man. The truth is no one is perfect and everyone has an imperfect tongue. James 3.3 3 continues, When we put bits into the mouth of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of his life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and creatures of the sea are being tamed and have been tamed by man. But no man can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers, this should not be. The Bible says our tongue is a fire. Just as a small flame of a match can start a forest fire, which can burn thousands of acres, so our small tongue can destroy a person's life. The Bible says our tongue is a restless evil. That is, it doesn't want to rest. There's a condition called restless leg syndrome. It's a condition in which a person can't stop moving their legs at night when they're trying to sleep. It makes it hard for them to get any sleep. The Bible says our tongues are like that. They are a restless evil. They don't want to rest. They don't want to cease from their evil. And when our ears take in a bit of gossip, our tongues just want to send it back out. Our tongues are a restless evil. The Bible also says our tongues are full of deadly poison. That is, the words we speak can be deadly. They can ruin another person's good name, their good reputation. A, a scorpion carries its poison in its tail. We carry our poison in our tongues. And to make things worse, James 3.8 says, but no man can tame the tongue. The truth is, uh, all of us are most certainly guilty in one way or another in how we use our tongues. There's no doubt about it. We all, at times, have said things about others that we shouldn't have said. If not a lie, then a truth that is still hurtful. We all have a naturally restless tongue full of evil. That's what the Bible says. So what are we to do? What are we, get, what are we to do? How can, we, how can you make your tongue pleasing to God? Well, let me give you a little list. Number one, acknowledge to the Lord that you have an evil tongue. If you gossip, if you have a I've told a lie about someone. If your tongue has hurt someone, then go to the Lord and confess your sin. Number two, you may also have to go to the person you gossiped or lied to and tell them you lied. Tell them what you said was gossip and ask for their forgiveness. Number three, you need to go to the person who you were talking about and, and talking to and confess your sin to them and seek their forgiveness. After you confess your sin, number four, to whomever you need to go, you need to repent. To repent means to go the other way. We need to stop using our tongues to hurt others and instead use our tongues to build up one another. Ephesians 4.29 says, Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. Now the Bible says, No man can tame the tongue. So how are we to truly repent? How are we to change our ways? It's true no man can tame the tongue, but the Lord can. 
the Lord, you remember in the Old Testament, the Lord caused a donkey to speak to Balaam the prophet? That's a pretty interesting, pretty interesting account. And if the Lord can control the tongue of a donkey, even making it to speak, then the Lord can control the that can, can, can take control of our tongues and, and make them be quiet. John 15, 5 says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from Christ, we can do nothing, and that includes taming the tongue. But Philippians 4, 13 says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. So realize, Christian, You need Jesus Christ to tame your tongue. Turn to him, ask him to take control of your tongue, surrender to him. Now let me give you a a few verses to think about and we'll, we'll be through. There's an interesting verse, Psalm 4610. It says, be still and know that I am God. This is a verse that is meant to comfort us in times of trouble. When our hearts are troubled, the Lord tells us, be still and know that I am God. But in this But in studying this topic, I I see another application of this verse. It's a verse that can also be used to help us to control our tongues. When you think of saying something you shouldn't about someone else, think of this verse. Be still. That is, keep your tongue quiet. It's as if God is saying, be be still and, and know that I am God. What you're about to say, I will hear. What you're about to say is wrong. Do you have a fear and a reverence of me? Then be still and know that I am God. I hear you, and I don't want you to talk this way. Another verse that God can use to help keep your tongue in check is Proverbs 6.19. It is one verse in a group of verses that tell us seven things that God hates. Proverbs 6.19 says, a false witness who pours out lies. God hates a false witness who pours out lies. And so keep that in mind the next time you're tempted to say some gossip or rumor about someone Keep that in mind. Listen to these other verses. Proverbs 19.5. A false witness will not go unpunished, and he who pours out lies will not go free. Proverbs 19.9. A false witness will not go unpunished, and he who pours out lies will perish. Proverbs 21.28. A false witness will perish, and whoever listens to him will be destroyed forever. And so, Christian, we must speak the truth. Let, let me conclude. You can't tame your tongue on your own Nevertheless, you need it to be tamed. You need to turn to Jesus Christ and ask him to give you the grace to have a tongue filled with grace. Use your tongue for blessing others. Use it to lift up others. Use it to encourage one another. Use your tongue to praise God and edify your neighbor. If you faulted someone with your tongue, seek their forgiveness. Make your tongue an instrument to be used by the the Lord for his glory. And as a Christian, you're probably going to have gossip spread about you. Your name might be tarnished for Christ's sake. A false witness might slander you because you're a child of God. If people say bad things about you because of your faith, that's okay. In fact, it's more than okay. Matthew 5.11 says, Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. It might be that we are slandered for our faith. If so, rejoice. Someone may hurt us with their tongue, but let's not be the ones to hurt others with our tongue.